Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the WTF1 podcast. I'm Matt, and joining me on this quarantine brigade... Is, is, there, is it technically quarantine now, Tommy? Like, what do you call it? Because it was like lockdown. I guess we're still in quarantine. Yeah, I guess. But we have to stay alert. Stay alert. The... Al- the- yeah, it's not stay at home, it's stay alert now. Go so to work, knows? but don't go to work. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. All that good stuff. But of course, Tommy is with me. Uh, I'm going to turn to him. There you are. Hi, Tommy. Can hey. see you there. Lovely. You're actually in my washing bin. Lovely. Oh, wow. Um, so today, we're going to continue the theme of Silly Season. We had the Ferrari episode, Who's Gonna Go? We were both kind of thinking it wouldn't be Carlos Sainz. And then it turned out, as soon as we'd pretty much recorded that podcast, Tommy, it, it, it was then coming out all over uh, Twitter, wasn't it? Yeah, we kind of came to the conclusion at the end that it was going to be Perez. Um, but yeah, Carlos Sainz, uh, good good call, I think, in the end. Made, yeah, made we thought Perez sense. was the safe option, didn't we? We, I, we kind of said, oh, you know, are Ferrari going to go for such a young driver lineup with like pretty much no wins apart from obviously uh, Charles's two? But they've gone for it, haven't they? They've absolutely gone for it. What, what do you reckon to the move? Because for me... It's an aggressive one. I think Ferrari, they want to win. They want to win world championships. And I think this is the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. We did a great stat on it, actually, that was um, that Ferrari have very rarely chosen drivers that don't score even a podium, never mind wins or championships. And Carlos Sainz has obviously only scored one podium before they signed him. Charles Leclerc didn't score any podiums before they signed him. So this is the first time that they've gone for essentially two drivers, pretty inexperienced. Obviously, Carlos Sainz has been in F1 quite a few races now because there's so many races in the year. But I think they've just got to go for it. I th- I think like what I said in the last one, it's almost like the young drivers are the the new talent. It's the it's the Sainz's, the Leclerc's, the Verstappen's. They're you know they're the new veterans almost if you like as soon as Hamilton goes so they've got to go with that yeah it feels like the driver markets have changed slightly where before it would be looking for the experienced ones that have proven themselves in midfield teams and whatnot but I mean obviously Carlos Sainz has done that but at a much earlier stage of his career because he's only 24 or whatever so uh, it is interesting to see Ferrari go for it I still think there is definitely some area of risk with this because as much as Carlos Sainz probably has gone into that saying, yeah, yeah, I'll be number two for the first season. I don't feel like he'll take being a number two, particularly lying down. And I think he'll be going there to Ferrari to to kind of rustle a few feathers, really. So it's going to be you, good. Would you agree with that? Um, I think he's, I think, like I said in the last one, he is one of those drivers that I feel is not as extreme as a Verstappen or a Leclerc where, and, and I guess part of it as well was the fact that Vettel, and Leclerc collided in Brazil and there was talk that they came to the conclusion at the end of last season which makes you wonder if that incident was a kind of wake-up call for them that was we can't we can't have this if Leclerc's going to be you know taking it to Vettel maybe they got Leclerc in as a driver that would learn from Vettel and then when Vettel gets to retiring age Leclerc would be number one but because Leclerc came in and was so rapid straight away Mm. they're just thinking ah we've got a problem here (laughs) so Carlos Sainz yeah I can see him being a little bit more cautious but like you say he's going to be want to be one of those drivers that wants to win he's got the opportunity now in a race winning car and he's not going to want to just not do that is he so yeah, I think it's probably one of the most exciting driver pairings going into 2021, just f- purely from a pace side of things. I'm really interested to see where Carlos Sainz stacks up with Charles Leclerc, because then when you kind of compare Lando and Carlos last season, it felt like Carlos had a slight upper hand, but obviously Lando's new to the to the sport. But yeah, yeah I'm just really excited to see uh, where 2021 um, brings us all in terms of who is the quickest driver within the team, because we've got lots of changes. Another one, is Daniel Ricciardo going to McLaren, which again, we haven't spoken about uh, on a podcast since it's been announced. It's uh, That one was, I guess, kind of surprising because of how open Renault were about building their future around Daniel. And it just seemed like their tone of voice kind of fit what Daniel Ricciardo was looking for when he first signed, but it all kind of just fell down the toilet a little bit. Yeah, the whole point of Daniel Ricciardo going to Renault was that he essentially wanted to do a Lewis Hamilton. So he wanted to join a manufacturer team that were pinning all their 
kind of experience and go, well, we're going to throw loads of money into it. And then when the new regs change, we're going to be rapid. And clearly Daniel Ricciardo does not believe that is going to be the case anymore. And like you're saying, it brings some excitement into 2021 because, of course, the regulations have now gone back a step, uh, back a year, which is obviously a problem for Renault in particular Mm. because they're very much just in the midfield at the moment, banking on the new regs, which they now have to wait for even longer. Yeah, which is a bit of a shame, isn't it? Yeah. Because we were all very much excited for the new regs, see where it, if if it shakes up the field, but we have to wait a little bit longer for that. But yeah. hope, well, again, at the same time, we were kind of thinking that this season coming up was going to be the closest yet. So, yeah. but yeah, but then testing happened, and then we thought Mercedes was still far. I, I don't know. There's lots of lots of uh, predictions flying around, but let's go to predictions and who is going to join Esteban Ocon at Renault in in 2021. There's yeah. a few few people up for grabs, uh, you'd have to say. And the first one is probably the spiciest and most controversial, maybe, in the sense of <laughs> that some people just don't want him back and some people do. And there's a lot of debate about it. It's, of course, Fernando Alonso. And we've got a few uh, opinions as well. So we've got at Jamie underscore day 27. Alonso, he is the sort of man Renault absolutely need. He would drive the wheels off that car and get the results they need in regards to feedback and to improve team morale and confidence that they need to try and go back in the forwards direction. And at Daniel underscore Srensen one says they should sign Alonso because if he returns to F1, he will only be driving in F1 for a year or two. It gives more time to let some of their drivers from their youth academy get a super license, for example, Zhu or uh, sorry, Joe or Lungard. Um, the <laughs> first comment about for, about Jamie uh, team Jamie morale saying, is a is a questionable one. Yeah, team morale and bringing confidence and him driving the wheels off the car. If you guys remember when things were going very badly at McLaren Honda. I feel like Alonso did the exact opposite and just didn't want to drive the car at all. So I don't know. I think it really depends on if Renault are on an upward curve in terms of their performance and (laughs) then Alonso will feed off that and do really, really well. But if they're struggling, it's going to be a different story. I agree. Alonso is the perfect driver to drive the wheels off the car. Yeah, I completely agree with that in terms of I don't think there's anyone better or certainly was better in Formula One that could drive an absolute kind of tractor of a car and somehow get either in the points or a podium in it than Alonso. However, like you say, McLaren, um, his problem with McLaren was he essentially joined McLaren because he wanted to win the world championship. And the reason he left McLaren is because he didn't get a competitive car to be able to win races. So why would, I guess the big question is, why would Alonso want to go back to a midfield team and just drive in F1 for the sake of driving in F1? And that's what's difficult to understand. He loves to troll on social media and he loves the attention of replying to Renault's tweets and saying like, and and he loves it when, you can tell he loves it, doesn't he? When people reply and go, oh, Alonso back in F1, this could be amazing. He will absolutely Mm. be loving that. But it all comes down to whether Alonso would want to be in a midfield team for the sake of it. For me, he, he left the sport and went on the pursuit of the Triple Crown because... And I have huge respect for him. Yeah, I have huge respect for Alonso for doing that because he said, the reason I'm going for the Triple Crown is because I have to sadly admit I'm probably never going to win another world championship because there's you have to be in a Mercedes to win a world championship and I'm not going mm. to be in a Mercedes. And to prove I'm a legend, the only other thing I can do is win elsewhere, which he went on and did. So why he'd go back to a midfield team is a very odd thing. Unless it's just purely from a... Look, I miss Formula One. Yeah. I want that adrenaline. I want that rush back. Maybe he, well, obviously the McLaren times weren't ideal and, you know, he was trundling around at the back, but he may feel that Renault are a, a much safer bet in terms of the fact that he'll probably be in the top end of the midfield in a Renault potentially. And then he can get that adrenaline back and be within the paddock again. And who knows? Everything's changing with these silly silly season stuff that, yeah. you know, maybe if Fernando thinks that he can just get it with back within the paddock, maybe uh, brush over a few wounds that he's left in certain areas of, uh, of Formula One. I don't know, but it, it it wouldn't be the most far-fetched thing to see Fernando come back. He's always said that he's wanted to come back in some form. 
So mm. it's just whether or not Renault is the right fit for him. It's, fu- uh, it's funny, think- yeah, you say that because in the last podcast, I think you were the same as me that I can't remember what I gave it. I think like a two out of 10 for Fernando Alonso joining Ferrari and I couldn't see it at all. But for some reason with Renault, I'm not counting it out. I could almost no, see it happening. because obviously Ferrari in a much different state than Renault probably are, where Renault's future is very much up in the air. Are they going to stay in Formula One uh, and all that sort of stuff? They need results and they need to to bring the team forward. If there's any, you know, they're a normal car manufacturer. They don't really have any reason moving forward in the Formula One regulations to continue in the sport in, in a lot of ways. So, yeah, it's, it's a weird one. I think Alonso definitely, there is a chance yeah, uh, what that likelihood is, I'm probably going to give it a because it's that fairy tale story as well. You know, Fernando going back to Renault after his two championships. Yeah, I'm going to give it a six out of ten. I was going to go four. Okay, four out of ten. Don't count it out, but seems unlikely. I'd love to see him back. I I I don't care what people say about you know he's had his, he's had his time. He's done this, done that. It would bring another element, and getting a world champion back on the grid for me as a you know, a racing fan, and I love to see uh, different personalities and, and and that sort of you know having world champions on the grid. I'd love to see him back, especially pure, especially if Vettel goes as well, because then exactly. you know you're losing champions. We'd only have Hamilton and Kimi, and Kimi would be going at the end of the year, I believe, as well. Yeah, because uh, that's his yeah. time up as well. So would that be just Hamilton on the grid? I've never even really thought about that. But would that be yeah. Hamilton the One... only champion unless someone won it this year, which seems unlikely? So. So yeah, it'll yeah. be him and Charles Leclerc. Perfect. Right. Um, <laughs> so what is your, uh, your out of 10? Four out of 10. Four okay. or five, yeah. We interrupt this WTF1 podcast very briefly to speak about our sponsor for this episode. You may have heard of them before if you're a regular listener. It's ExpressVPN. If you don't know what ExpressVPN is, it's a software that thousands upon thousands of people use every day to protect our data online. In the time since we've started using ExpressVPN, hacking methods have grown even more sophisticated. And I'm sure a lot of you are working from home these days in the current climate and without the IT department to protect you from online threats. So it's important that you take action on your own to secure your devices you use for work. That's why I recommend using ExpressVPN for the best online protection possible. You might be thinking that security threats don't affect you personally or it doesn't affect your phone or whatever you use, but not using ExpressVPN is like leaving your front door unlocked every time you go out. Sure, nothing might not happen for years, but when it does, it can be devastating. One of the easiest ways to secure your internet data is with ExpressVPN. You click one button on your computer or smartphone and you're protected. So make sure you protect your data today by visiting our special link, which is expressvpn.com forward slash WTF1 and get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com forward slash WTF1. Right, back to the podcast. Our next prediction or choice, uh, we've combined the two because they're both uh, Renault Young Driver uh, Academy people, (laughs) drivers. (laughs) Uh, drivers And they are Guan Yu Zhou and Christian Lungard. So, yes. firstly, Guan Yu Zhou from at Microwavable240. Mm-hmm. Got, got to question that as a handle. Part of the Renault uh, Young Drive Academy, Guan Yu Zhou would partner Ocon and give Renault two drivers that can help the team develop into a competitive outfit. I don't know if you can say that. How can you, from someone that's such a young driver, how do you know? Obviously, there is certain levels of development that yeah, Renault will be yeah, yeah. teaching, but you can never guarantee that a rookie will be able to bring that side of of uh of their sort of skill set to, to a formula one car and at passion 1g says i feel like they should pick a renault Dri- academy driver since they haven't promoted any of their drivers to f1 since grosjean entered f1 10 plus years ago it makes sense having an academy it doesn't make sense having an academy if they don't promote anyone but if i had to pick someone it would be joe aitken or lungard now jack aitken he's not part of the yeah, I put this in to address this because yeah. when we asked the question, and it's, it's understandable because we've not essentially had any F2 racing, so a lot of people may be out the loop. But yeah, Jack mm. Aitken is now uh, Williams, uh, Williams reserve F1 driver reserve. and uh, no longer with part, part of, of the, the Williams Academy. So yeah, yeah, uh, it's he's not he's not going to be in the frame anymore. So just wanted to address that in case everyone like, why are you ignoring Jack? <laughs> yeah, Jack Aitken no longer part of the Renault uh, yeah, Academy. Yeah. So, so I think it's between uh, these two, realistically. Yeah, Guan Yu Zhou and Christian Lungard, pff, I don't see it. I don't Ooh. see it, especially with how Renault is at the moment. Look, they're trying to move forward. They 
for me, obviously, we've spoken about experience and that when we thought Ferrari would have maybe gone for more experience in the team. But I think Renault definitely need that experience that neither Joe or Lungard would be able to bring, especially partnering Ocon, who has proved himself in a midfield team. But I don't know. I, I just feel like they would lean more towards other options personally. What do you think? Oh, this is where this is where we're going to disagree. Um, oh, you reckon? E- yeah. One of these. Uh, I am very, very strongly in favor of them doing this and i will go as far as saying that at the end of this year if they do not promote one of these two drivers they should literally just give up with the junior program right now because they for me renault don't have a good enough car to attract a big name driver they've got a driver program with so many drivers in it and they've had so many drivers in it for so long two of those drivers are now in the top uh top teams in f2 so have that chance to get into formula one and i i get where you're coming from with ocon he's not exactly he's very new to formula one and he is still a bit of a rookie almost and he took a year out but i just don't think renault have the luxury anymore with the performances they're getting to get an alonso or a vettel or a hamilton or a ricardo anymore because they've just Mm. proven that they're not good enough and the, these drivers that are in their junior program, it would almost be an insult to them if they didn't promote them because it kind of defies what's the point. They've already they already kind of did it once where they hired Ocon instead of promoting a junior, and now Ricardo's gone. They've got a vacancy, and it's the perfect opportunity to promote a junior. If they don't do it again, for me, it's just like, we'll just shut the driver program down then because it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, fair. I mean, it's a fair point, but they've gone over 10 years and since they last did it. So why do they feel forced to do it now? I'm not sure. Maybe on a, on a budget level, obviously, it'd be a lot cheaper to, to sign a Joe or a Lungard. And really, it depends on their, their actual finan- finances and how they're doing on that side of things, because... Again, that's another thing to take into account with this whole coronavirus situation, isn't it? It's that you, you've got this, you know, loads of teams are losing money and everyone's losing money. Do they then think, right, well, the driver market, we can save some money here. Let's let's promote all yeah. of our young drivers. So that that in itself could be a, a, definitely a, a reason why one of these two gets promoted. I think maybe Joe would get promoted over Lungard personally. Uh, and Joe's proven himself more and Lungard was F3, wasn't he? Yeah, so I can I can already see the comments uh, on this as well, which, yes, I know that neither of them have enough super license points. Uh, however, um, so, so for people that don't understand the super license thing, I'll just explain it very quickly. So uh, after Max Verstappen joined Formula One, when he was 17, he went from karting, went straight to F3, did a few F3 races, and then they signed him to F1 at the age of 17. Loads of F1 fans and people were outraged because they thought this isn't right that anyone could be in Formula One with so little experience. So they made like a knee jerk reaction where they added this super license point system. And basically, the super license points is you get uh, points based on where you finish in championships. So the better championships you finish in, you get points. So uh, I've got actually the the stats of the championship. So if you finish in the top three in the FIA Formula 2 Championship, you get 40 points and you need 40 points to join F1. So if either of them two finish in the top three, they've done it regardless. Yeah. So, so, so they've done it anyway. And I think they have some points anyway. Uh, well, and Joe was in F2 it, last year, right? Exactly. So he's already got some points to his name. So is Lungard. Um, so it's... It is possible that they could get enough this year, and I think it is more than likely with the teams that they are in that if they do finish in the top three in the championship, they Renault should be promoting one of them personally. Okay, yep. That's I, I see it likelihood. I guess you've sort of swayed me a little bit with, with what you were saying about the Young Driver Academy, but still probably not as much as... Uh, I, oh, oh, I'm going to give it a five out of ten. Likelihood. Right. I'll go for eight based on whoever uh, eight for whoever wins essentially between the two of them. Okay. Whoever, All right. whoever finishes on top in F two. Fair enough. Now this next one I think isn't the most far fetched one. Uh, Nika Hulkenberg. Mm. So at James Lewis twenty one says Hulkenberg as he's always reliable and Renault need a point scorer would do a great job and Ocon would learn a lot from him. 
and at Muro 50 I think the smartest move is Hulkenberg. He knows the team very well and could help them back up to the top, or he could be a seat holder until a Renault Young Driver Academy driver gets enough super license points, which we've already clarified may not be a problem as long as they finish yeah. in a decent position. But it could, in it F2. could be, so yeah, they might need someone. They might need someone indeed. Uh, and, and yeah, and I guess, are they willing to take that risk or will they wait until the last minute to then sign uh, one of them? That's, that's that's the question. That's a very good point, actually. Yeah, the um, obviously they would have to wait till the season finishes and it depends if they want to wait that long for yeah for that to happen. Exactly. Is your eight still an eight, Tommy? Is your eight still an eight? No, it's still an eight. Still, still, still an eight. Okay. I think they'll do right. it. Yeah. Uh, I think Nico Hulkenberg is a very weird situation <laughs> and yeah. it's almost like you know a breakup and then they get back together. Yeah, very true. I still think that they could go that route because Nico has said that he wants to come get back on the grid. I think he was almost forced out of Renault with with Daniel Ricciardo uh, and Ocon. Yeah. So it could just be a a reunite a reunited moment. What do it's you think? A, it's an odd one, isn't it? I wrote that Cyril Abitbull seems like the kind of person that has quite the ego on him. We see that from. Uh, the Drive to Survive series with Horner, they're very much, uh, he, he likes to, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but yeah, not not kind of show any vulnerabilities or anything. And yeah, he, he's, he seems like the kind of person that would be embarrassed by having to sign Hulkenberg back and maybe wouldn't do it because it would be embarrassing for the team and the whole situation that they came crawling back. It would mm. be a, it would be a bit of a PR nightmare. I can I can see yeah. it happening, but I can also see the downside of them thinking it's already embarrassing enough that Ricardo doesn't trust us, and now we're going back to our old driver that we fired. Yeah, it's I see what you mean bit, in terms yeah. of the image it 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 portrays is not great, is it? But then they can spin it that obviously they've got Ocon, who is a fresh talent again. You know, he's he's proved himself at what was Force India and. Yep. They've got that side of the garage where there is some sort of young, prosperous talent and uh, and obviously got Hulkenberg that could just be seen as, you know, look, let's get him back in. He was a great foundation for the team. But yeah, at the same time, it, it depends on their mentality, doesn't it? It depends on what exactly they're trying to achieve and the, the sponsors and what they want as well, you know, because mm. at the end of the day, Hulkenberg's had his chance and he hasn't had one podium. So yeah, I feel like Nico may, even because of the records that he has... Might be willing to take a little bit of a pay cut to go back to his former team just to try and maybe have that one last chance to, to yeah. get that elusive podium. It's, yeah. There's a lot of factors and, and that's the beauty of this podcast. I'm sure a lot. some of you might be thinking, oh, you keep going if, but when, you know, maybe. That's the whole but point. But that's, <laughs> that's the whole point of this specula- speculative podcast. And um, I encourage you guys as well uh, to get in the comments and say what you think. And I'm sure you disagree with both of us. Uh, but, but yeah, that, for me, that's... That could be a route where where Hulkenberg just just wants to get back in the car. You know, he he can't. He maybe doesn't feel like his time with Formula One's finished just yet. Yeah, exactly. It's it's weird because uh, going back to the point of the situation that Hulkenberg got fired and the PR nightmare, it's very odd because if I took that completely out of the equation, for me, Ocon and Hulkenberg would be an absolute banging line. Even though I'm not, I don't massively rate Hulkenberg to the point where he gets quite lauded as the most underrated driver ever and I don't personally agree with that no, but yeah, for same. me Hulkenberg and Ocon is such a solid great lineup for Renault in the position that they are yeah it's just whether Agreed. they are willing to go through that uh, <laughs> go PR through the turmoil. kind of PR turmoil and embarrassment for Hulk himself um, which I don't think that's a problem his side because personally I think he will jump at the chance of getting Formula One seat again. Yeah. Uh, but from Renault's side, do they need further embarrassment of going? Ah, uh, yeah, we're really screwing this up. We'll at the have moment. you back now. Yeah. That's all right. Danny's gone. You can come back. Yeah. It's it's an odd one. Uh, mm. I think personally, likelihood seven out of ten. I think he's the most likely of the ones we've we've gone gone through. Hmm. Uh, I will go, what do I say for Alonso? Four, four or five. I'd have to say five or six. Which one, Tommy? Six. Let's go six. Okay. Six. Next yes. one is a driver that didn't even really cross my mind. Uh, Pierre Gasly. So at Adam Dickinson 01 says, he's clearly fast in the right car, but doesn't look to have a future at Red Bull, having to be a number two driver to Verstappen. Won't stay forever at Alpha if they don't see him at, Red Bull and a Frenchman, all French lineup at Renault would be good. Mm. 
at unknown god, I imagine that's supposed to say. <laughs> uh, Gasly will switch to Renault and then have an all French lineup. Now, I, I know that obviously Renault do like their uh, sort of promoting the, the French brand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to be fair, I haven't odd. really even, it hasn't really crossed my mind at all, uh, Pierre Gasly. It, it, Me neither. Yeah. Very, it's very weird it's because, weird um, yeah, I put the tweet out saying, you know, get your questions in for the podcast. Who do you think is going to Renault? Get your suggestions. And genuinely, hadn't Gasly hadn't even crossed my mind. And I would go to the point of saying that Gasly was mentioned as much as Alonso and Hulkenberg, which really surprised me. There were so many, so many comments about Gasly, and it really hadn't occurred to me at all. Adam yeah. Dickinson does make a good point, though, that he doesn't really have a future at Red Bull. He's had his chance. That Red Bull are never going to promote him again. That that's how I see it anyway. With how cutthroat their yeah, yeah. their procedure is, they have got great drivers in Albon and Verstappen. They're not going to, going away anytime soon unless Verstappen gets signed to a Ferrari or Mercedes or or whatever. Yeah. So for me, yeah, it is a dead end. He he is at Toro Rosso. Now, oh, sorry, Alfatori now, or he goes somewhere else. And it would be a good sideways move to go to Renault because then it gives him an opportunity with the fact that maybe Renault get good in twenty twenty two. Uh, to be able to then prove himself again, but yeah. right, he will never be able to prove himself at Alpha Tauri. Well, yeah. really, let's let's be real. And, here. and who else left Toro Rosso because they couldn't get promoted to Red Bull? Joined Renault on a uh, whim, and then somehow got their promotion to Ferrari. Carlos Sainz. So yeah, it can happen. You, it's Carlos Sainz now has opened up a massive opportunity to show that if you don't get promoted to Red Bull from Toro Rosso, it's not over and maybe that's something Gasly could uh take um a lot of kind of positivity from and think you know this could could genuinely happen however um I cannot see Gasly going there at all and also Mm. there is a very strange story which I don't know how um many people are aware of it but Gasly and Ocon have a very weird bad relationship with each other in what way? Uh, they are childhood friends, uh, used to go karting together. And Gasly, I think it was last year, came out on a lot of podcasts and media and basically said that Ocon was a very good friend. They used to kart together. And then as soon as Gasly started beating Ocon, they fell out and they do not talk to each other almost at all Um they can be mutual with each other and have a conversation that, about non-motorsport things, but they're very much uh, a bit of a, yeah, there's a bit of strange. history and beef there, which I thought was very strange because they both seem like very likable drivers yeah. who seem quite easygoing. But yeah, they they have this very strange dynamic where they were childhood friends and don't really talk and have a very sour relationship now by the sound of it. So mm. Mm, weird. That is very odd. Very strange indeed. Maybe that maybe in a weird way, Pierre Gasly will be like, yeah, let's do it. Let's have it out. <laughs> yeah. Me and you, Ocon. Let's Same go. Same car. This sort of Teammates. Decide. Who's yeah. actually the best? Uh, but yeah, very interesting. Uh, mm. So maybe that that definitely will maybe put him off just slightly if, if there's not that relationship there because it does help a lot when teammates can get on. Uh, yeah. So let's say likelihood. I'm going to go with a five. I'm going to go with a four. three. Four. Yeah. I've said a four. Again, you said a three. Can't see it okay. happening. I don't see. I don't see them getting that much out of signing someone like Pierre Gasly, to be honest. And it yeah. would again, it would again be an insult to the junior program if they signed someone like Gasly, to be honest. Yes. That it would. That it would. Mm. Uh, and finally, on our list, we have Valtteri Bottas. Mm. Now, I would love to see Valtteri Bottas sign just purely because it would then open up a Mercedes seat. <laughs> and then that is just chaos, isn't it? That is just absolute chaos. Do we see George Russell go there? We'll have another podcast with loads of Mercedes prospects. Who knows? But uh, at Sam Elliott 64 says, would say a lot about Valtteri Bottas if he took the seat, either stay in Lewis's shadow at Mercedes or show he wants to be a world champion at Renault. Big opportunity. And at Khalida Naziha, Valtteri, we need a vacant seat, Mercedes seat for Seb or George. Brilliant. Not even about Valtteri's uh, future. And at Furry Karova, we need to see the ultimate Vettel versus Hamilton on the same car before both retire. I mean, that is a pipe dream and a half. That is not going to happen. Clip this. It is not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, fu- it's so- funny that all the uh, 
Valtteri seems like quite a valid option to me, but it was funny that every single reply about Valtteri going to Mercedes was more the fact that they wanted him out of the Mercedes seat than actually Rather wanting than him, him to go, go to Renault. Good for his career. Yeah, yeah great, great move for his career. I mean, apart from Sam Elliott, who does say, look, yeah. do you want to stay in Lewis's shadow at Mercedes or go to Renault? For me, if I'm Valtteri Bottas right now, I'd stay in Lewis Hamilton's uh, shadow. He's in a race winning car at Mercedes. If Mercedes are happy to have him, he'll win a few races now and again. And I think there's going to be a lot more than what Renault can currently offer him. So for me, I don't think that would be a a great shout at all, personally. Mm. Um, what do you think, Tommy? Formula One is a weird sport, isn't it? Because it I'm... depends on people's motivation. Exactly. As well, it? It, it, every driver changes. You, you know, you see. Uh, People will be lo- looking at Bottas that go, oh my God, you're in the Mercedes, I need that car. And then it's it's a classic case of grass is always greener on the other side. Bottas will probably be looking at other teams going, I'm sick of being Hamilton's bitch. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna, uh, and we've said this so many times on the podcast that if Hamilton retires tomorrow, they're not promoting Bottas to number one driver. He will just they're going to get George in and build the team around George or they're going to get yeah. another superstar like Verstappen and build the team around Verstappen. They're not... Bottas is a number two driver not to take over from Hamilton, but just to play second fiddle to Hamilton, in my humble opinion. I think a lot of people agree with that. Um, so it, so for him, it's it's all about deciding, do I want to just keep having a chance at winning, but probably never going to win a world title or do I take an absolute punt like Hamilton I guess did with Mercedes and go Mm. I'm going to leave I'm going to join Renault and do what Danny Rick didn't and stick around and hope they do get an absolute banging car in 2022 now uh, with an amazing seat so it's it's such an odd one again Bottas a bit like the Ferrari one that we said exactly last time, where he almost seems like the perfect fit for them, but can't see it happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's very it's, weird. It's difficult that we can't decide. I can only imagine what Valtteri uh, would maybe be thinking uh, mm. about all of this, because uh, it's a very difficult decision. I guess it's Renault in a different position, though, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, that their future isn't certain within Formula One. And Valtteri, if he makes that risk and it doesn't work out at Renault, that could be it. That could be him done. And then he doesn't get a seat at all uh, in Formula One. Because how old's Valtteri? Like thirty odd. Oh, you put me on the spot there. Um, yeah, sorry. I think ooh, he's probably about thirty, know. isn't he? Yeah, he must be thirty, something like that. 30-ish. Maybe a bit. No, maybe a bit younger actually. Let me have a I'm look. I'm going to look it up right now. Twenty six, I guess. Keep, keep the, keep thirty. The he is thirty. Bang on 30. thirty. Smashed it. See, wow. boom. I am the Formula One guru. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think you know it's not towards the end of his career because we've seen people go into their forties in Formula One, but. In this modern That's age, weird to think Bottas is thirty. Now it doesn't feel like he's. It does feel old. I feel like it? he's got. Yeah, that's very strange. Um, yeah, go on, carry on. No, just say it's just a. Uh, it's not the end of his career by any stretch of the imagination, mm. but also, he's at that age where if he falls out of Formula One, he could then never come back. So a hundred percent. And the the thing with him, uh, taking a. Uh, I guess he has to think about if he does take a punt with Renault, leaves Mercedes, Hamilton does retire and George Russell gets promoted, even though we believe that he wouldn't be given the opportunity to win a world championship. Maybe he'd always have that in the back of his mind that when, you know, maybe what 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 if he did stay, George Russell mm. joined and he did... Um, this might maybe sound like a, a low key um savage remark, but maybe he if he did like a Rosberg in twenty sixteen where George Russell was quicker but had six failures at the start of the year and he puts himself in a world championship winning position and then can't be caught. So Yeah. It, 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 people will be saying whatever way he goes, it's kind of a great call or a bad call because you could stay at Mercedes. Everyone wants to be in that Mercedes because it's the best car, but yeah, you, yeah. you also no one wants to be Lewis Hamilton's teammate. So, very no, I think for Valtteri, stick it out, mate. If you, yeah. I'm sure you're watching this podcast, Valtteri, just <laughs> st- just stay, just stay at Mercedes. If Lewis does retire and George gets promoted to number one, he may not be that quick in his first year at Mercedes. We obviously every, every suggestion says he is very, very quick. 
but he may not be yeah. the polished cut diamond that uh, he'll be in the future. So for me, that's probably Valtteri's best chance of winning a championship is when Hamilton retires, if Mercedes are happy to keep him. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, yeah, yeah, I'll be number two, be number two. Oh, you want to promote George? That's when he hits. That's when he strikes. Yeah. And then he's got to hope that Mercedes is really good and he's probably a midfield car then. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You never know, do you? But yeah, yeah it's a very difficult decision for, for Valtteri if he does have that on the table. I think likelihood, I, oh, three out of ten for me. I'd go f- five, the same as Alonso for me. Okay. Wouldn't never say never, but maybe seems a little unlikely. Never say never. What a great Justin Bieber song. Um, <laughs> so that's showing my colours of my music taste. Yeah. That is it. We are finished for all the predictions. Let us know who you think is going to Renault in the comments section below. Make sure to like, subscribe, rate us on Apple Podcasts or whatever app you are using. Five stars, nothing less. And also make sure to check out ExpressVPN that sponsored this podcast. And that is it. I'm sure you'll let us know your out of tens in the comments as well for the ones that we've suggested and then any others we'll look forward to reading them. But uh, that is it, Tommy. Anything else to add? Uh, I will just say that I think uh, we didn't actually touch on this too much, but I think Ocon is a little bit uh, not underrated, but I think it's important to remember that Ocon was very highly rated in the same breath as a Verstappen and a Leclerc in terms of how amazing he was in junior series. So if Renault do get the car that they want, you know, maybe he is there. Leclerc or their Verstappen to take Renault to the top because I think he I per- think he would be a great number one Agreed. driver. Agreed. There you go. Perez is extremely highly rated on the grid and Ocon was more than a match for him. Mm. So yeah. let's see. Let's see how good Ocon is when he gets back on the grid. But that is it. Thank you so much, guys, for listening slash watching. And to Tommy, who I am now waving at to my oh, sorry. left. Let's wave this Lovely. Way. I just and... banged my mic on my other mic. Good lad. Thanks so much for watching slash listening, guys. And we'll see you for the next podcast very soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Are you still waving at me? No, I wasn't, but now Ah, I am again. Because last time I stopped waving and then you're just waving forever and I didn't. So I'm waving now. I'm, I'm still waving. Okay. Bye. Bye.